25th hour radio show. Kathleen, at what point in your life did you feel the entertainment business was your calling? You know, when when did you know this was what you wanted to do? I really felt at the age of eight that I was really happy with kind of being around the house, singing and dancing. And my brother and I, we used to, used to do little shows for my mom and dad and family. And um, my mother would always take me to see some of the movies at the theater and uh, just saw the big screen and people up there doing things. And it was so exciting and really so lifelike that. And, and, and coming to the screen is something I knew I just wanted to do at the age of eight. And, uh, and then I went on to uh, high school and got in some of the high school plays and entered in a few little local contests and different things and always loved singing and, of course, acting and modeling. So entertaining was just really in my blood, flowing through. Were you like so many other people looking to make a name for yourself in the business? Did you did you move to California to pursue your dream? Oh, absolutely. I'm from originally Girard, Ohio, which is right next to Youngstown, Ohio, which is near Cleveland, Ohio. <laughs> I'm trying to get people to get familiar with the area. You know, you have yeah. to work your way down. But, um, yes, and, and, you know, being from Girard, Ohio, is a wonderful place to be from. And it really built a lot of character. And, you know, having been with the seasons and all of that and different things of that nature, so you learn to uh, adapt very well and you know coming to california was a breeze at, at some point but i did have uh, my family here my uh aunt actually and, and my cousin they lived here which was great so they helped uh put me up for a little while and show me the ropes because it can be actually a little frightening coming from that little town coming to big old los angeles california <laughs> a little country girl yeah. not having been exposed to a lot of the things here but that's been quite some time ago. I tell you, thank God. <laughs> it's such a fast pace of living right now. It's crazy. But I came here about almost 40 years ago. Oh. So do you, do you remember your first job you landed as an entertainer? I ask everybody the same question here. A job as an entertainer. I actually was with a group called the Love Machine. Oh. Seven beautiful love, yeah, young, young ladies. We sang and danced. And actually, I got that job as a result of being in a beauty pageant, Miss Black California Beauty Pageant, in which I won the pageant. Mm -hmm. And uh, a man by the name of John Daniels, he was the owner and proprietor of a very nice uh, uh, popular club here in Los Angeles called Mavericks Flat. And he had had different groups together before, and he always wanted to have a female group together. So he got seven of us together, trained us, we sang, we danced, and uh, actually we performed in Central Pay, France. Wow. Can you believe it? Our very first paying gig. <laughs> we All had the way over in France. We had band and everything. Yep, we had an eight-piece band, three horns, a full uh, rhythm section, and we, we schlepped our way over there. I got off the plane in Paris and took a bus down to Central Pay. And you have to imagine, many years ago, uh, we thought that was really kind of primitive. We had to spend... Uh, the the night in the rooms with like three or four people in the room, the girls, mm -hmm. and you know the the bathrooms were down <clears throat> down the hallway and no running water in the room. <laughs> <laughs> but it, we had a great time. It was a great experience, and we always we had gone back to Central Bay several times after many years that I was in the group, and we really looked forward to it because it is such a wonderful, beautiful place down there. So how, so how did your role as, as a model on The Price is Right come about? Was there an audition process, or were you hand-picked? Well, there, no, no. There was quite an audition process. As a matter of fact, my agent, Judith Fontaine, mm -hmm. she called and said, Kathleen, Kathleen, they're looking for a black model on the show for The Price is Right. You would be just <laughs> wonderful. The likes of you would be very, very good with the rest of the girls. You're going to go to an audition. So I went to an audition at Markets and Productions, I saw two of the assistant uh, producers there, and they talked, and I had ha I have a, a swimsuit on under my clothing. And lo and behold, actually three months prior to this, I had just had a baby. Mm. I had a son, I had a baby boy. But you know, actually being in the business for such a long time, I always took care of myself. Your body and your face are your passport in this business. So I did maintain a certain amount of 
you know, um, and not too much weight, but I did have to shed a few pounds when I found out about it. So they liked me for that audition and then invited me into CBS studio on the Price is Right to do behind the scenes with screen test and opened the door and I showed my wares and showed their wares <laughs> <laughs> and did. And they liked me very much. They, in turn, invited me back to do a segment of shows live on the television. And basically, at that time, we were taking two shows a day, three days a week. You'd work for, like, we worked three weeks, and then we were off a week. So it was quite a blessing. But uh, they saw many, many young ladies, and uh, maybe about 250 girls throughout a period of time. It took them six months to finally come to their senses, to realize <laughs> I was the chosen one anyway. <laughs> now, did, you so got, you got a, to see your competition, right? You got to see the competition you were up against? You know what? Some of the girls I did see, yes, I did, because some of them, obviously, they were showing live on television, and I did get a chance to see them. So many of them of whom I knew and uh, that were in the business with me and everything. So it was, uh, you know, quite interesting to, to see everybody like that. So when so you were hired as a Barker Beauty for the you were actually the first full time African American woman to have that position. I want to know: Did you ever feel like you were treated differently because of your skin color? You know what? There is. Let me just say this in general, in the industry, especially maybe I would say when I first started, which was oh wow, almost fifteen years ago. There was an undertone, and there always has been. Every time I've even worked on a set somewhere and being a person of color. And though it was it was nothing directly geared toward me or said to me by any of the stagehands or the, the, the girls or the producers or anybody, but, you know, you just kind of have that feeling like they're not treating you or you're not accepted as equally as the other people of a lighter hue. Um, and though I did have an uh, instant, instance where one of the producer girls, um, not producer assistants, she's a black a young lady. She worked with the production team. And she told me a few times, she said, yeah, Kathleen, I've been in the meetings. And, you know, a few times some of the producers or director had used the N-word and laughed. Mm. Thought it was mm. funny. And then they kind of looked at her and I kind of thought, you know, like she was like a little fly in the room and forgot she was there and or black. And then they kind of look around, <clears throat> clear their throats and keep on with the order of the day. But they they were really very good people there to work for and work with. And, you know, by and large, the, there wasn't too much of that kind of attention around the set. But there weren't that many black people even working uh, tech you know, grips and different things of mm-hmm. that nature. So it's picked up quite a bit. If things are changing in the industry for uh, minorities, which is a good thing. So I'm very glad about that. Well, how, how well did you get along with your fellow models? Did it always feel like a, competi- a competition between you and the girls? Did you ever have any altercations uh, uh, physically, uh, emotionally, or anything like that? Getting any? I never had anything physically with any of the models, nor actually... Uh, uh, vocally, Diane Parkinson, she befriended me when I first got on the set. She and Janet and Holly were arch enemies. Ooh. They had not always been enemies. They were all there for quite some time before I got there, maybe 15, 16, 17 years on that show. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> Diane and Holly and Janice, um, they somehow things happened in their relationship and it really got tarnished. And when I first actually got on the show, I didn't really quite notice that they were not speaking to Diane or really friendly or chubby, chubby, hubby with her. But she was glad I was there, obviously, so she had found a newfound friend. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And um, just over a period of time, you could see things happening now. They were not relating to each other, especially at rehearsals. And Holly just really did not like Diane. I mean, she let, let it be known. Pretty much. And Holly, she's a Virgo. I love her dearly. <laughs> My daughter's a Virgo, too. They are so much alike. There's a love-hate. There's no in-between. But there was a, uh, one time that Diane and I went into Janice's dressing room for a quick change during the showcase. And I kind of instigated it because the dressing room, Janice's dressing room is near the makeup room. And actually, the only way 
through her room is through the makeup room. This wasn't enough room in the makeup room for Diane and I to make that very quick change for this showcase. I said, come on, let's go into Janice's room. So we went in there, and lo and behold, and he even finished getting dressed. Here comes Janice. Oh, my God. She <laughs> went off on me and uh, Diane. Oh, my, what the? Blank, blank, blank. Are you doing in here? Get that. Hey, that. Oh, my God. I was so, I mean, I'm like, dear sweet Janice, is this you? <laughs> so we got Showing out another room. side it's, of her. <laughs> yeah, and it caused such a big stink. All the crew and everybody came backstage and said, what's going on? What's going on? What's happening? And, uh, it was very loud, very verbal. And actually, after the show, Barker got wind of things. He said, what's going on? What are you girls doing? What's going on? And we explained it was an accident, and I felt so bad. And Janice apologized to me. She said, it wasn't geared towards you. But it was Diane. She knows full good and well. She's no business being in my dressing room. That's just how much she didn't like her. Mm-hmm. But listen to this. The tabloids, of course, tabloids got a hold of it, and saying that, that big cat fight. They were physical. <laughs> they were ripping each other's clothes off and clawing at each other. And da, 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 da. I'm like, oh my God. It was nothing of the sort, but it came pretty close. But, you know, it, it was just one of those things. And for the most part, you know, like I said, I got along perfectly well with all the girls. I didn't want to get into any any disputes or arguments that were already pre-existing before I got there with the girls. I loved my day job. I wasn't about to jeopardize it because inside with one person or, or another. So, so, so you've written, so you've written this book backstage at the Price is Right, and you know, and you talk about yes. some some of the things that we've already discussed. But to write a book, you know, a successful book, you have to drop some bombshells on people. And without going into too much detail, because, you know, we want people to buy the book, can you give our listeners a little rundown on some of these topics, if you would? You know, just a hint of what they can expect. You know, I've read sure. somewhere there's like a, a sex tape scandal. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And once again, we must say backstage at The Price is Right, memoirs of a Barker beauty. Yes. And mm-hmm. you know what? Uh, you're right. When you have your memoirs, People don't want to hear little boring things and whatever. And this is my book. It's my life. And I'm telling it. Yes, I am. I promised I wouldn't <laughs> then, but I'm telling it now. Nah, hell. <laughs> so, you had to make you know, sure the, the price was right, right? You know, I, I do have to. And just hopefully nobody's coming after me. But what the heck? <laughs> you know, <laughs> scandal's good sometimes. Mm-hmm. You just got to get out of it. I may have to call Olivia Pope. <laughs> <laughs> well, hope not, but... But no hope not. But anyway, yes, um, Diane was having a somewhat relationship with the actor songwriter Kenny Rogers, mm. and during the period of time, Kenny he was not lo- not so much her. Well, with her and a couple other women, as we found out a little later, he talked to them. They'd have kinky phone sex, and Kenny was taping these conversations on the phone. He Uh-oh. taped them, literally taped them on the cassette. It was cassette time, okay? Uh, and he yeah. taped these kinky, kinky, uh, sexy conversations, and uh, he really liked Diane a lot, and you know, Diane had told me about it. He, she and Kenny, she uh, confided in me, and I said, I know Kenny Rogers. She said, what? I said, yes, I met Everybody Kenny Rogers. Everybody knows Kenny Rogers, the- especially back in that uh, period. I mean, he was yeah, huge. But I, I mean, I, I really personally knew him. Back in 1970s, like three or four or five, when I was with my the singing group, The Love Machine, um, we did the Las Vegas Hilton together. They were uh, at the lounge there, as well as we were performing at the lounge. So him and, and you know, um, the first edition, it was before it was even Kenny Rogers in the first edition, it was just the first edition. Mm-hmm. They loved us. Those guys were so great, and we, you know... Um, May, we just became good friends because we'd hang out after the shows and have a couple little cocktails or whatever. Um, you know, breakfast time, we'd see them and whatever. We worked maybe about a week or two weeks together there with them. So, of course, we we developed a nice relationship with poor, just friends, friends. Mm-hmm. But they were just sweethearts. And Kenny, in particular, was kind of like, not sweet on me, but, you know, hey, what can I say? So prior to, ni- to me getting on the show, maybe about 1988, uh, 87, 86, I used to be the trophy presenter for the American Music Awards. Oh, yeah, that's a big deal there. 
Yes, yes, yes. I did that for several years. So I was able to get next to all the stars, all the entertainers and what have you during the rehearsals. And lo and behold, that one particular year, Kenny Rogers and Dolly Hall, uh, pardon, were hosting the show. And I was like, oh, my God. And I saw Kenny. I said, hi, Kenny. Hey, you remember me? He looked, I said, Las Vegas. He was like, hmm, Las Vegas. Mm, <laughs> what stays in Vegas? You know, yeah, what, really? what goes on in Vegas stays I, in Vegas. Yeah. And that's what I said. Oh, no, nothing like that. I said, I was with the love machine, Kathleen, the love machine. He said, yes, Hilton, Kathleen, how are you? We talked for the longest time, what have you, before he had to go on to uh, rehearse. And he said, you know, I'm doing photography now, and I would love to shoot you. I'm doing all the celebrities and different people and everything. He said, oh, you know, you could use it in your modeling or whatever you're doing. And, and actually, we set up a, a shoot a date shortly after that, and he shot some beautiful pictures of me, one of which is in my book, Backstage at the Presses, right? The Memoirs of Obark the Beauty. Mm-hmm. And uh, so anyway, Diane was just in awe of the fact that I knew him that well. And she got him on the phone and said, Kenny, do you know Kathleen Bradley? <laughs> and he says, yes, I know Kathleen Bradley. And she put him on the phone. We talked and chit-chatted. She's like, give me that phone. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, what happened with the text, the sex tapes, a couple of the other women, somehow they wanted to sue Kenny. They didn't feel it was right. I guess word got out or something. And uh, they wanted to sue Kenny as well as Diane because they said she was part of it or in on it or he had made uh, some suggestions to have a menage a trois, threesome or something in Vegas and some other stuff. It got kind of hairy, really, really messy. <laughs> and, of course, Kenny was still married to Marianne at the time. And Oh, yeah, that, well, that caused a big stink. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, Diane was cut up in the middle a little bit because she felt bad. She, there was no reason really for her to have been sued. But these tapes got out. They literally got out. Uh, there used to be a, re- a TV show called, uh, oh, God, Something Affair. I forget what it was. Well, I think it was Mark Povich. Oh, okay. And they actually, Current Affair, they yeah. played some of those tapes on, on the TV, but they had to bleak out so much of the darn stuff. <laughs> and then the tabloids got a hold of it. They ran with the story. They, they you know, it's all documented. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, as a result, I think... Uh, I forget what happened in the actual lawsuit, but it was a big mess, a big scandal around CBS, Diane Parkinson caught up in the love triangle, text, uh, sex tapes and all that kind of thing. You know, well, who would have known Kenny Rogers was really so kinky? For a wholesome family show. <laughs> who, who would have known Kenny Rogers was so kinky? Hello, he's an entertainer. <laughs> hey, she, they, a lot of them, they all have that in them, you know, it's yeah. just a matter of coming out and doing, you know, they get getting girls and women and panties thrown at them all the time. <laughs> but in essence, he's a great guy. He's a sweetheart. But, hey, everybody needs love however you want to get it, it be it on the phone or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're right there. What about these mm-hmm. uh, dirty little secrets between a model and her boss? Well, that's Diane and Bob. Once again, my lovely Diane, she's going to really just hate me when she gets reading this book. <laughs> but you know what? Everything is documented. Everything is out there. I'm just putting it out there, reiterating, because it's my story. And I lived through it. I lived in it. And I was part of some of the, you know, things that had happened. And um, so she and Bob Barker had a sexual consensual relationship. Mm-hmm. And... They, uh, you know, after she, he let her go, really. He did not really do a good job. When she was still working on the show. He kind of let her go. Yeah, so Bob, stopped, Bob was, was Bob married at the time? No, Bob's wife, Mary Jo, she had passed away okay. from cancer several years prior to that. So he was not really seeing anybody at a point and not, you know, heavily involved with anyone and, to the, for the most degree, and, and then Shia, Diane just said, Bob, you need a little hanky-panky in your life. You know, when you work with somebody every day all the time, and you're just close to them, you can just get some type of physical attraction that just happens. Bob's a very good-looking man, and Diane's a beautiful girl, and she, you know, he was still <laughs> filling his oats. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, so she, uh, she filled his oats. <laughs> So, so there's all kinds of dirt, if you will, in this book. And, I, and I've always wondered, and we spoke about this a few minutes ago, do authors ever get retaliated against for going out on a limb and telling the truth about subject matter like this? I mean, have, oh, have you had any? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to, uh, you know, the book has just come out. As, as a matter of fact, 
it can be ordered right now just exclusively on my website, which is www.kathleenbradley.tv. Okay, kathleenbradley.tv. That is my website. It's a beautiful website. And I have my uh, shop at my store there. You can order my book, hard copy or a soft cover. It will be going to Amazon very soon and, uh, you know, e-books coming soon, 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 and uh, will be probably Barnes & Noble. But, you know, basically I, we self, I self-publish. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, very kind of expensive, but it, in the final analysis it's going to be kind of worth it and what have you. But, it, it, you know, that's another thing. I encourage people to write their stories and tell your story. Everybody has a story. Mm -hmm. And uh, self-publishing, what they call independent publishing now, is becoming quite popular. But, you know, you tell it like it is. It's my story, my memoir. And, you know, I just really took me about seven years to write. And I really made a conscious effort to make sure I didn't really step on anybody's toes. I didn't really want to say anything really negative. If you read the book, I don't really say things negative about Bob Barker at all. It is not a Bob Barker bashing book whatsoever. Mm -hmm. I do not bash him. I don't bash the top feel of anyone in there. What I do do is I have so many um, tabloids, newspapers, and articles that I kept over the years, as well as documented depositions from lawsuits that Bob Barker was involved in that I have quoted or have put in the book that other people have said. So I'm allowed to say allegedly this is what they had said Bob did, or what they thought of Bob in a certain way and what kind of person he is. They said it, I wrote it, okay? <laughs> now, being, being a first-time author yourself, is there more work involved than you initially expected? I mean, it's one thing to write a book, but then you have to promote the book. Do you enjoy all that? Go, do, you, do you enjoy all that, that goes into writing this book? I mean, the interviews, the book signings, the travel? Oh, you know, I'm telling you, I am, and I have, thoroughly enjoyed writing the book. It, is de it was definitely a labor of love. Like I said, I had some great editors, and my husband was so wonderful and instrumental in helping me put the photos together and the cover, and then I had some great graphic artists and whatever, and, and I'm a very creative person as well. I always had the vision of what I wanted to look like front, back, everything, and what to say, and all of that. So it was a labor of love. It was rather grueling. There were nights I'd stay up uh, start writing at like 12 o'clock and went and get in the bed till 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning, mm. which it was really nice and quiet around my house. And sometimes my little six-year-old grandson <laughs> comes bugging me and, and all the things in the course of the day. So you do need time. Maybe have a little Jack Daniels on the side or whatever <laughs> motivates you. Okay? Me and Jack spent a lot of time up. <laughs> a lot of time together. You and Jack are really good friends. Yes, yes, yes. Hey, I'm friends with but, Jack myself. Uh, but you know the book has just come out. And um, maybe within the last month, actually. Mm -hmm. So I haven't done any book tours as of yet. I am um, doing some major TV shows uh, very soon. I will be doing the New York Circuit morning talk shows, this, <clears throat> that, and the other, as well as, you know, a lot of other things and promotions. And like I said, my website's out there, and I got a great promo on my YouTube you got to see it. I have celebrities endorsing my book. It's about a four-minute YouTube where people are holding uh, the book up to their faces, and they say, I just can't put it down. Tom Halleck's on it. He has his morning coffee. He has the book. He says, you know, I'm not in this book, but I just can't put it down. <laughs> then I have Qu Quentin Aaron. I have Ron Jer Jeremy. I've got... Uh, oh, you got the hedgehog Jeff on there, huh? Yeah, he's in there. And I got uh, Jim Brown, Marla Gibbs. Uh, Fred Williamson, The Hammer, uh, several people of that caliber, Warren Moon, because I actually went to a few events, and I had the book, and they're my friends and people, and they just did it for me, like a real quick second of you don't know who's behind the book when they pull the book down. But go check that out at my website. It's also on the website, KathleenBradley.tv. <laughs> now, now, you spoke about your website. What about your social media? Do you do uh, social media, Facebook and Twitter? Yes, I do. I have my uh, Twitter account, which uh, I forget what the call letters are, but let me see. My daughter and my son and my nephew kind of helped me get all that together. Mm -hmm. It can be a little complicated initially setting things up. But my um, 
my I'm on uh, Instagram is Kathleen Bradley underscore Mrs. Parker. And now that Mrs. Parker is from the movie Friday. Oh yeah, we we know all about it, Miss Parker. Oh, yeah, yeah Miss Parker, <laughs> Mrs. Parker. That's Kathleen Bradley underscore Mrs. Parker. And then my Twitter is Kathleen Bradley without the Y. So, and then you know, just go to my website. I have all of my links thing, linked up there that you can go in uh, IMDb and my YouTube and Facebook and everything's right there for everyone to come on and enjoy and be part of my journey. So you also sell, wait a minute, now you also sell clothing, the Miss Parker clothing on your website, right? Yes, I do, honey. Mm-hmm. Oh, we, it, it, they're, they're just coming out. Nobody has one yet. I don't even have one. But we've just finished the, the design and talked to the uh, printers and getting it right with the Miss Parker in the front. And it says, hi, Miss Parker. <laughs> and on the back it says, hi, boys. And I just I got it copywritten and everything. So as not to... Uh, you know, we have to be very careful about doing um, uh, paraphernalia from having been in a movie or being a part of a movie because they most of the time they will not allow you to make a character or caricature of yourself. However, <clears throat> that's why I said it's M I Z, Ms. Parker. Yeah, Ms. Okay. Parker, that's right. Uh huh. And I took my own little picture bending over that water hose. <laughs> Thank God I did it about ten years ago, but. <laughs> now, do you do you mind people calling you Miss when you're on the street? Do you have people say, "Hey, Miss Parker"? Uh, oh, I don't mind at all. I love it. It is really a gas. In the stores, people will come up to me. Even the, the checkout guys, like the Costco's and stuff. This one guy said, "Miss Parker." He leaves his station, and comes over. He says, "I just got to give Miss Parker a hug." <laughs> they love Miss Parker. I said, "Hi, boys." They just love hi, Miss Parker, Miss Parker. But they're saying, "My auntie." She gets it all the time when she's out there in the, in the yard. And women tell me that today. Yeah, they call me Miss Parker. Miss Parker is just awesome. I tell you, that was like the second highlight of my career in my life, being able to play that role and how far it's taken me to uh, another level in terms of... Well, it's uh, one of our highlights, too, being able to speak to Miss Parker. Hi, Miss Parker. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Hi, boy. <laughs> Kathleen, I want to thank you for taking time out of your uh, Sunday morning to join us on the show. It's been a blast. And everybody, make sure you go to uh, Kathleen's website. Uh, the book's called Backstage at the Price is Right, the Memoirs of a Barker Beauty. And uh, Kathleen, once again, thank you. My pleasure. You guys have a great day because I'm going to have one here in sunny California, not to rub it in. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have a great day, and we will too. And thank All you right. very much. Peace. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Radio show. Like you were treated differently because of your skin color? You know what? There is, let me just say this in general, in the industry, especially maybe I would say when I first started, which was, oh, wow, almost 15 years ago, there was an undertone, and there always has been every time I've even worked on a set somewhere and being a person of color. And though. It was it was nothing directly geared toward me or said to me by any of the stagehands or the, the the girls or the producers or anybody, but you know you just kind of have that feeling like they're not treating you or you're not accepted as equally as the other people of a lighter hue. Um, and though I did have an instant instance where one of the producer girls. Um, not producer assistant. She's a black a young lady. She worked with the production team, and she told me a few times. She said, "Yeah, Kathleen, I've been in the meetings, and you know, a few times some of the producers or director had used the N word and laughed. Mm. Thought it was mm. funny, and then they kind of looked at her and I kind of thought, you know, like she was like a little fly in the room and forgot she was there and or black. And then they kind of look around, <clears throat> clear their throats, and keep on with the order of the day." But they they were really very good people there to work for and work with. And, you know, by and large, 
that there wasn't too much of that kind of attention around the set. But there weren't that many black people even working uh, tech, you know, grips and different things of mm-hmm. that nature. So it's picked up quite a bit. If things are changing in the industry for uh, minorities, which is a good thing. So I'm very glad about that. Well, how, how well did you get along with your fellow models? Did it always feel like a, competi- a competition between you and the girls? Did you ever have any altercations uh, uh, physically, uh, emotionally, or anything like that? Getting any? I never had anything physically with any of the models, nor actually uh, uh, vocally. Diane Parkinson, she befriended me when I first got on the set. She and Janet and Holly... My family here, my uh, aunt, actually, and, and my cousin, they lived here, which was great, so they helped uh, put me up for a little while and show me the ropes, because it can be actually a little frightening coming from that little town, coming to big old Los Angeles, California, <laughs> a little country girl, yeah. not having been exposed to a lot of the things here, but that's been quite some time ago. I tell you, thank God. <laughs> it's such a fast pace of living right now, it's crazy. But I came here about almost 40 years ago. Oh. So do you, do you remember your first job you landed as an entertainer? I ask everybody the same question here. A job as an entertainer. I actually was with a group called The Love Machine. Oh. Seven beautiful lo- yeah, it was young ladies. We sang and danced. And actually, I got that job as a result of being in a beauty pageant, Miss Black California Beauty Pageant, in which I won the pageant. Mm-hmm. And uh, a man by the name of John Daniels, he was the owner and proprietor of a very nice uh, uh, popular club here in Los Angeles called Mavericks Flat. And he had had different groups together before, and he always wanted to have a female group together. So he got seven of us together, trained us, we sang, we danced, and uh, actually we performed in Central Pay, France. Wow. Can you believe wow. it? Our very first paying gig. <laughs> we All had the way over in France. We had band and everything. Yep, we had an eight-piece band, three horns, a full uh, rhythm section, and we, we schlepped our way over there. I got off the plane in Paris and took a bus down to Central Pay. And you have to imagine, many years ago, uh, we thought that was really kind of primitive. We had to spend... Uh, the the night in the rooms with like three or four people in the room, the girls, and mm-hmm. you know the the bathrooms were down <clears throat> down the hallway and no running water in the room. <laughs> <laughs> but it, we had a great time. It was a great experience, and we always we had gone back to Sancho Pet several times after many years that I was in the group, and we really looked forward to it because it is such a wonderful, beautiful place down there. So how, so how did your role as, as a model on The Price is Right come about? Was there an audition process, or were you handpicked? Well, there no, no. There was quite an audition process. As a matter of fact, my agent, Judith Fontaine, mm-hmm. she called and said, Kathleen, Kathleen, they're looking for a black model on the show for The Price is Right. You would be just <laughs> wonderful. The likes of you would be very, very good with the rest of the girls. You're going to go to an audition. So I went to an audition at Mark Gibson Productions. I saw two of the assistant uh, producers there, and they talked. And I had to ha- I have a, a swimsuit on under my clothing. And lo and behold, actually three months prior to this, I had just had a baby. Mm. I had a son. I had a baby boy. But, you know, actually being in the business for such a long time, I always took care of myself. Your body and your face are your passport in this business. So I did maintain a certain amount of, you know, uh, not too much weight, but I did have to shed a few pounds when I found out about it. So they liked me for that audition and then invited me into CBS Studio on The Price is Right to do behind the scenes little screen test and opened the door and I showed my wares and showed their wares <laughs> <laughs> and did. They liked me very much. They, in turn, invited me back to do a segment of shows live on the television. And basically, at that time, we were taking two shows a day, three days a week. You'd work for like, we worked three weeks, and then while we were off a week. So it was quite a blessing. But uh, they saw many, many young ladies, and uh, maybe about 250 girls throughout a period of time. It took them six months to finally come to their senses, to realize (laughs) I was the chosen one anyway. (laughs) Now, you got got to see your competition, right? You got to see the competition you were up against? 
You know what? Some of the girls I did see. Yes, I did, because some of them, obviously, they were showing live on television. And I did get a chance to see them myself, many of them of whom I knew and uh, that were in the business with me and everything. So it was, uh, you know, quite interesting to, to see everybody like that. So when so you were hired as a Barker Beauty for the you were actually the first full time African American woman to have that position. I want to know, did you ever feel? Kathleen, at what point in your life did you feel the entertainment business was your calling? You know, when when did you know this was what you wanted to do? I really felt at the age of eight that I was really happy with kind of being around the house, singing and dancing. And my brother and I we used to, used to do little shows for my mom and dad and family. And um, my mother would always take me to see some of the movies at the theater and... Uh, just saw the big screen and people up there doing things, and it was so exciting and really so lifelike that. And, and, and coming to the screen is something I knew I just wanted to do at the age of eight. And, uh, and then I went on to uh, high school and got in some of the high school plays and entered in a few little local contests and different things. And I always loved singing and, of course, acting and modeling. So entertaining was just really in my blood, flowing through. <laughs> Were you like so many other people looking to make a name for yourself in the business? Did you did you move to California to pursue your dream? Oh, absolutely. I'm from originally Girard, Ohio, which is right next to Youngstown, Ohio, which is near Cleveland, Ohio. <laughs> trying to get people to get familiar with the area. You know you have yeah. to work your way down. But, um, yes, and, 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 you know, being from Girard, Ohio, is a wonderful place to be from. And it really built a lot of character. And, you know, having been with the seasons and all of that and different things of that nature, so you learn to uh, adapt very well. And, you know, coming to California was a breeze at, at some point. But I did have uh, were arch enemies. They had not always been enemies. They were all there for quite some time before I got there, maybe 15, 16, 17 years on that show. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> Diane and Holly and Janice, um, they somehow things happened in their relationship and it really got tarnished. And when I first actually got on the show, I didn't really quite notice that they were not speaking to Diane or really friendly or chubby, chubby, hubby with her. But she was glad I was there, obviously. So she had found a newfound friend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, just over a period of time, you could see things happening now. They were not relating to each other, especially at rehearsals. And Holly just really did not like Diane. I mean, she let let it be known pretty much. And Holly, she's a Virgo. I love her dearly. <laughs> My daughter's a Virgo, too. They are so much alike. There's a love, hate. There's no in-between. But there was a, uh, one time that Diane and I went into Janice's dressing room for a quick change during the showcase. And I kind of instigated it because the dressing room... Janice's dressing room is near the makeup room, and actually the only way through her room is through the makeup room. There wasn't enough room in the makeup room for Diane and I to make that very quick change for this showcase. I said, come on, let's go into Janice's room. So we went in there, and lo and behold, we didn't even finish getting dressed. Here comes Janice. Oh, my God. She <laughs> went off on me and... Uh, Diane, oh my, what the blank, blank, blank are you doing in here? Get that. Hey, that. Oh my God, I was so, I mean, dear sweet Janice, is this you? <laughs> but we got Showing out of another room. side of her. <laughs> yeah, and it caused such a big thing. All the crew and everybody came backstage and said, what's going on? What's going on? What's happening? And uh, it was very loud, very verbal. And actually, after the show, Barker got wind of things. He said, what's going on? What are you girls doing? What's going on? And we explained it was an accident, and I felt so bad. And Janice apologized to me. She said, it wasn't geared toward you. It was 
It was Diane. She knows full good and well. She's no bit 